All right, let's step it up a notch. Prophets and Apostles has said when the millennium gets here, things are going to catch fire and we're going to have to step it up a few notches. It's not going to be easy. It's going to require a lot of effort on our part, but we will have help, not just by other beings, but by something else. Welcome to the last dispensation. You're living in it. I met a man named Melchizedek He was a good man, a good man Wandering lonely in the desert he All right, let's step it up a notch, shall we? Let's get into some heavy stuff. All right, the millennium, the millennium, uh, you know that thousand years of peace on earth that we're all looking forward to, right? Well, I've been thinking about how some folks might be a little apprehensive, maybe not understanding what to expect, but we're going to get into some heavy duty doctrine because I'm here to tell you that the millennium is not something to fear. It's just the beginning of something incredible. Now let's get something straight. Uh, the millennium is not going to be something boring. It's not going to be stagnant. Uh, it's going to be powerful. We're not going to be sitting around twiddling our thumbs, uh, growing gardens, uh, I always think of those tracks, and I love the Jehovah Witness people, don't get me wrong, or even the Seventh-day Adventists, but you think of the tracks, right, that, that you've seen in the laundromat, or they hand you at the, uh, maybe some of you haven't been to the laundromat, uh, I have, or when you, know, when you were in college, or whatever, these tracks where you see this utopia, there's all these different nationalities eating um, their porridge with panda bears and laying there eating grapes with lions. I don't think that's the way it's going to be. As a matter of fact, uh, not according to uh, Neil A. Maxwell, it's going to be a time of unparalleled growth, uh, development and learning and, and spiritual, um, major spiritual development. We are going to receive uh, the only thing that we understand, it's going to be a stone. That's what we understand. We don't know what that stone looks like. We don't know. Uh, well, you know what? I think we're being prepared right here. We are being prepared. This is my stone that I hold now. And it, and it has in it the apps, right? The LDS apps. And everything that we need uh, to to be good stewards of um, the gospel of Jesus Christ and living on this earth. But think about it: we're going to have Christ Himself also reigning on the earth. Can you imagine the wisdom and knowledge that He will share? It's going to be mind blowing. And here's the kicker. We're going to have the opportunity to be involved in something that is extraordinarily amazing. Now, I know you're getting tired of the buildup here. Let's go on. Let's talk about it. Because we're going to be building Zion uh, physically and spiritually. Now, will everybody? No. But there will be peace amongst those people. All right. But not everyone will be trying to build Zion. Not everyone's going to be gathering Israel, just like not here. But there will be, there will be no murderers. There will, there will be no telestial beings. There will be no murderers, whoremongers, uh, liars, thieves. They will all be gone. But there will be those who want to, um, Eat uh, grapes <laughs> with monkeys and um and grow tomatoes and flowers and we'll do all that too. But there will be people that won't be interested, but they will be happy that they have peace and that they have Christ. But the Father they desireth not. Here's where it gets really exciting, brothers and sisters. The millennium is not just for members of our church. President Brigham Young taught 
that there will still be people of all faiths and denominations on the earth. It's not like everyone suddenly uh, is going to become a Latter day Saint overnight. But this will be where this will be the make or break. Okay. This is still considered our second estate. Maybe our third estate. I would, I, no, it is considered our second estate still. But we, we will be gathering Israel. What our prophet today is saying. And, and the 15 men, this, that's a precursor to what uh, we're just being prepared for the millennium. Okay. But remember, that's a thousand years. That's a long time. Uh, so we'll have an amazing opportunity to share the gospel with people from all walks of life. I would say the millennium is a crucible for spiritual growth. Absolutely. While the millennium is a time of, uh, of portrayed as, uh, is often portrayed uh, as a time of peace and understanding and righteousness, it will also be a period of intense spiritual refinement. Elder Neil A. Maxwell offered this insightful perspective. The millennium will not be a period of idle bliss, but one of enormous and accelerated spiritual development. Don't go away, folks. I'm getting into some heavy duty stuff. I know you know your millennium stuff, but just maybe there's something here. I'm, no, you don't understand, man. You don't understand. Here we go. Those who have chosen the terrestrial kingdom, which I mentioned earlier, will have the opportunity to progress towards celestial glory. Did you know that? They're not just going. So if you're left here in the millennium and you aren't destroyed, you have an opportunity to advance. You do. This progression will require significant effort and change, though. It's not going to come easy. So what does that suggest? That suggests that the millennium will be a time of active learning and growth, not just passive employment of peace. No. Let's talk about the role of translated beings. What will they do? Why are they important? There will, be, there will be mortals upon the earth and there will be translated beings. President Joseph Fielding Smith taught about the unique role of translated beings during the millennium. He said, there will be those who have been translated like the city of Enoch, who will return to earth to mingle with and assist mortal beings in the great work of the millennium. Uh, and that might be us. When a person lives to the age of a tree, they will be translated. And there will be those who, there will be translated beings on the earth, but then there, there will be those who will be with those who are celestial minded and they will not be part of this earth. And we will minister to the earth, the righteous translated beings. Um, it will be those who have not experienced death yet, and they will provide a living link for temple work between the mortal <clears throat> and immortal worlds. Joseph, Smith, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith taught, taught that there will be technology or something where, uh, well, the priesthood and the power of God will be so strong. So, yeah, isn't that neat? Isn't that wonderful? That's just incredible. It's incredible. <laughs> It's incredible. So many things are happening. I'm stressing out because I'm going to be in St. George. Yeah. St. George. Uh, Wednesday, going to do an endowment at the St. George Temple. And then um, I'll be at the, that firm. Uh, what is it? Nah, firm. I'm going to the firm conference later. Yeah. I'll be speaking on the 24th the next day. Um, I might do a little presentation in St. George as well of the thing that I'm doing. And then on temples and gospel is ancient. Uh, from two to four at the, uh, well, check this out. I will be in St. George on the 23rd and you are invited for free. This is a very 
informal event. Just come and hang out and talk. And that will be at 914 South 100 East Washington, Utah, 84780. And that will be from two to four at the Forward Motion Medical Building. That's 914 South 100 East Washington, Utah, 84780. And interestingly enough, it'll be right after I visit the St. George Temple. I'm going to go do an endowment there. I've never been to the St. George Temple, so this will be the first time. We'll be going the morning of the 23rd, and that is a Wednesday at the Forward Motion Medical Building in Washington, Utah. That's 914 South 100 East, Washington, Utah, 84780 from 2 to 4 p.m. Uh, the firm conference is coming up. Uh, so go. So I will be speaking Thursday. Yes. Speaking on the main stage on the first floor, 345 to 430. Eternal Echoes, the ancient esoteric gospel. That's the firm foundation featuring the 34th International Book of Mormon Evidence Conference. I've never been there, but I hear it's fabulous. Faithfully exploring relevant Latter-day Saint topics of our I'm Thursday, Friday, and Saturday from 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. October 24th, 25th, and 26th of this year, just in a few weeks. Where's it going to be? At the venue at the ranches, 4118 North Clubhouse Lane, Eagle Mountain, Utah, 84005. Right? To conceptualize this is amazing. Translated beings acting as intermediaries, brothers and sisters. That adds a fascinating dimension to our understanding of a millennial society. Technological and scientific advancements. These are things that many brethren have taught all the way back to Orson Pratt, Neil A. Maxwell, uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, James E. Talmadge, Bruce R. McConkie, and many others that we don't talk about. While we often focus on these spiritual aspects, the millennium will likely see unprecedented advancements in knowledge and technology. Elder James E. Talmadge speculated that the increase of knowledge characteristic of the millennium will be manifested in a myriad of ways. What did, what did he mean by that? Well, I'll tell you, we may anticipate discoveries and inventions far exceeding the most advanced achievements of our present age. And I've been saying that and people come in the, in the comment section and go, no, it's all going to be by the priesthood. Yes, the priesthood of God is real and it's there, but that doesn't mean that God and Jesus don't use technology. They do. They do. They don't do everything by the priesthood and by faith, but it's there and they can when they need to. And I believe that they use their power, I would say, righteously, reservedly. It, it is reserved righteously for moments where they, they can and will use it through faith and their, their power right? Their perfect knowledge, all right? Not faith, but they have perfect knowledge. That doesn't mean that they don't use the material things. They have a material body. How do we know that Christ and his angels will not arrive in um, vessels? We don't know that. We may anticipate discoveries and inventions far exceeding the most advanced achievements of our present age and all consecrated at the purpose of God. So there won't be, I was talking to Jared, we're not going to have the selfish uh, creators of these cell phones and TVs and computers that, that, that gatekeep some of the technology and only give us certain parts where if it only updates up to three years and then we have to spend more money. Nothing will exist because of greed. Does that make sense? Nothing will, will be manifested and exist because of greed. 
the millennium, the millennium will be a time of incredible innovation and progress all aligned with divine purposes. And here's the paradox of agency and righteousness. One of the most intriguing aspects of the millennium is how universal righteousness will coexist with individual agency. Think about that. Universal righteousness will coexist with individual agency. Bruce R. McConkie offered this thought-provoking insight. During the millennium, the, enti- the enticements of Satan will be removed. Yet individuals will retain their agency. So what will that look like? This present, uh, this presents a unique spiritual laboratory, brothers and sisters, where righteousness flourishes. Not because of absence of temptation, but because of the abundance of light and truth. And agency says, I will accept that. Right now, you know people that have been to the temple and never go back again. And you know people that go to the temple and go for the rest of their life. Light and truth is there. That doesn't mean that every agent, bodily agent, with mind and all faculty, accept it. Some reject it. And in different degrees of rejection to where they're happy and content with panda bears and oatmeal and tomatoes. Salsa with chips. I'm hungry. Okay. By exploring these deeper doctrinal concepts, we can gain a more nuanced and profound understanding of the millennium. Moving beyond surface level descriptions to contemplate its transformative potential for individuals and society as a whole. It will not be the pamphlet. We will have colleges. See, the Lord's coming to burn every corruptible thing, but temples are still going to stand when the millennium begins. The temples you see today will not be burnt, which means that other good things of the earth will stand. So when you hear the brethren say that we're going to have children and grandchildren and those who I'm looking at will, you know, go get your education. Don't stop planting cherry trees. Don't. Okay. Colleges and, well, some of those colleges will be burnt, but you understand there are good uh, institutions and edifices that will continue to be here because people's religious uh, choices and their agency will still be allowed. There will be Catholics that will worship Jesus Christ. There will be Muslims that will worship Jesus. Jesus Christ. And if they want to know the Father and his plan, they will, which is still the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, I know some of us um, are thinking, but what about Satan? Isn't he going to be bound? And you're right, he will be. But that doesn't mean, like I said a few minutes ago, that we won't have challenges or opportunities for growth. We'll still have our agency and there will still be work to do. And I talked about technological advancements. Now, what is this white stone? Let's, let's speculate about the white stone. We learn about it from Revelation chapter 2, verse, verse 17, exploring um, some profound and esoteric interpretations of that and what Joseph Smith said and others. Uh, so let's let's propose that. Let's dissect that. Here are my proposed ideas, and here are the proposed ideas of some Latter Day Saint scholars and leaders. The the white stone as a celestial computer. Um, some thinkers 
among our crowd have proposed that the white stone could be a form of advanced celestial technology. Even Elder Neil A. Maxwell once speculated the white stone mentioned in the book of Revelation may well be a kind of celestial computer chip which contains a recorded history of one's life as well as the host of ordinances performed in the temples of oneself and for one's ancestors. Now, he didn't understand the technology that we have today. He passed away, well, he passed away in 2004, I believe. So he probably had a cell phone, but not the kind of smartphones that was before smartphones were really coming about. Understand Urim and Thummims, Seer Stones, that TV stone that I showed you on that other video. Before I forget, brothers and sisters, if you are enjoying the content, don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, and ding the bell for notifications. Your support means the world to me and helps the channel grow. And hey, if you want to contribute to the program, I do prefer Venmo first, then Cash App, then PayPal, then Zelle. And I've got cool products. I got cool merch. That's all being designed. I get a percentage of it. And that's if you're interested. Remember, your comments are what keep this community thriving. So drop your thoughts below. And if you're feeling extra generous, consider becoming a YouTube member or sending a thanks, a super thanks right there. The button's right below the screen during our videos. Uh, now back to the topic. It's interesting. DNA. Could DNA be a part of that? Uh, the white stone might serve as a repository of eternal knowledge and personal history far beyond our current technological capabilities. Um, will it be a key to unlocking uh, celestial mysteries? Joe, President and Prophet Joseph Fielding Smith, the, the grand nephew of the Prophet Joseph Smith, offered a more mystical interpretation. But, but that was before, way before Neil A. Maxwell. So as the further we go back, probably the less myopic of an understanding they have. Or maybe they have more of a, an, an understanding than we do. He said the white stone will become a Urim and Thummim to each individual who receives one, whereby things pertaining to a higher order of kingdoms will be made known. This stone will reveal to the individual all knowledge pertaining to his exaltation. This view posits the white stone as a personal oracle, granting access to divine knowledge and celestial secrets. A symbol of theosis. What is theosis? Well, some scholars have connected the white stone to the concept that the idea of humans can be, become gods. Now remember, Eastern Orthodoxy uh, believed in theosis way after the Nicene Creed. Oh my goodness. Which means that theosis was a thing during the Nicene Creed. Hugh Nibley wrote about that, and he said this, The white stone with the new name is the key to advancing in the eternities. It represents not just knowledge, but transformation, the process by which we become like God. Close quote. This interpretation sees the white stone as a symbol of our divine potential and the process of eternal progression. A literal piece of the celestial kingdom is the key to advancing the eternities it represents not just knowledge but transformation the process by which we become like our heavenly father this interpretation sees the white stone as a symbol of our divine potential and the process of eternal progression a literal piece of the celestial kingdom a piece of that sea of glass a piece of the earth that we come from. In a more literal interpretation, brothers and sisters, some have suggested that the white stone might be a physical piece of the celestial kingdom. Orson Pratt taught each individual who is counted worthy to enter into the highest glory will receive a white stone which is given to him as a token of his acceptance. It's a gift from our Heavenly Father to you or as a tool for progression. This stone is probably 
Well, he says this is probably literal, a piece of the celestial earth itself. This view connects the white stone directly to the physical substance of the highest heaven, a vessel for the divine name. Some interpretations focus on the new name that we get written on the stone. Bruce R. McConkie proposed that the new name written on the white stone is the key word of the celestial kingdom. It is the name by which an exalted person will be known through all eternity. It is the word which opens the door to Godhood. The perspective sees the white stone as a vessel for a divine name that grants access to the highest levels of exaltation. Brothers and sisters, these deeper interpretations of the millennium, of the white stone that we receive in the millennium, and all good gifts from God will not come without a price. They do not come easy. Neil A. Maxwell said that it will take great effort, much effort on our part to make it. But we will have the help of the atonement still as we do today, and we will not be required to be perfect yet. But to go beyond simple symbology of good, We must suggest to ourselves and to our Heavenly Father that these profound connections, brothers and sisters, to eternal progression and divine knowledge and the very nature of Godhood itself is important to us. If it is not important now, we need to fast, we need to pray, we need to supplicate, we need to make those changes, we need to break these barriers in our hardened hearts. They challenge us to consider let's even the white stone, not just a reward. The millennium is not a reward, but these are keys to unlocking the mysteries of eternity. God.